All right, let me uh, try to do this really quickly. I know everybody's hungry for lunch. Thank you for the organizers for having me. Uh, here to talk about these two wonderful papers about immigra immigration, refugees, and the US experience. Um, so I had a chance to read these two very interesting papers, and I recommend that uh, anybody who has the opportunity should also take a look uh, by two leading scholars in the field of immigration who are looking at two distinct research questions using two different methodologies and two very particular groups of undocumented uh, immigrants coming from Mexico and also refugees coming from Cuba. So I'm struck by this theme of two, and so what I'm going to try to do here is stick with that. Uh, I'm one discussant, but providing two discussions. And here's what you're gonna get. You're gonna get two brief recaps of each paper. I'm also going to try to summarize what I think are the key contributions of these papers. Um, two sets of quite short comments, uh, and then also some suggestions and future ideas that I had. Also, uh, Doug already beat me to this by recommending a movie, but you're also going to see a flavor of two documentaries and two movies, so you have four Netflix choices tonight. Uh, if you've taken nothing away from my discussion at all, at least you have something to watch at home. All right, so let's get into the first paper, the one by George, The Wage Impact of the Mariolitos. Uh, just to uh, recap this paper really quickly, the numbers are amazing. Uh, 110,000 people from Cuba arrived literally overnight in Miami, and about 55,700, almost 56,000, were actually able to enter Miami. The others were diverted to other parts of the United States, or I think some were maybe sent back home. Um, and among these, predominantly, almost a huge fraction were low-skilled immigrants, that is, those without a high school degree, high school dropouts. And this represented a tremendous supply shock. I think George mentioned this briefly, but it's worth saying again, uh, an 18% supply increase in the number of high school dropout workers in Miami's labor market. Right? And so the key research question here is basically, did this inflow of refugees impact the wages of existing workers in Miami? Okay? Uh, and the identification strategy, the methodology uh, with which this paper does this, is to one, focus on the group of workers that are most likely to be uh, impacted by the inflows of refugees. That is, focus on the wages of low skill, that is high skill dropouts, uh, non-Hispanic males. Okay? And importantly, uh, the paper uses a difference in difference approach, that is looking at the wages of this group before and after, and also in Miami and against control, group, control cities. Um, and something interesting in this pa paper is that he uses various different control groups, which I'll mention again in a second. Um, and just to recap the main findings of this paper, uh, wages declined for low-skill males due to this Marielle influx. To give you a sense of the number of how big that was, average wages declined anywhere from 10 to 30 percent. Uh, and what I think is really interesting is that this is uh, the wage decline was a delayed response. The largest impacts appear actually three to five years rather than immediately. Okay, so some contributions of this work that I think really stand out. Uh, George, I don't think you mentioned this during the actual talk, but you know, over the 30 years of immigration research that economists have produced, one of the things uh, we've figured out is that when you study immigration, you should probably look for impacts on the group most likely to be affected. Um, so in this case, he's going to look at uh, low-skilled males that are going to be in direct competition with the Mariolitos that are arriving from Cuba. Hey, also, what I really like about this paper is that it is uh, amazingly visual. I think the entire story can be told all through graphs, um, which makes it very, very accessible for pretty much anyone, not just academics reading this paper. Um, importantly, there's a methodological contribution by improving on the original study by David Card, uh, using a difference in difference, but this time choosing control groups uh, in a little bit uh, more innovative way. That is, using a new method called synthetic controls or this other method, basically looking at the employment trends of different cities uh, before the Marielle shock happened and finding the ones that look closest to Miami. And these are important improvements because it the choice of control is important, as we've seen. Um, and these methods allow uh, the choice to be less user-driven and a little bit more objective. Okay? 
Also, uh, I think the use of different data sources is really nice because it allows for a lot of robustness um, and assembling more data and having more current data to look out, to look back on the past has been really great because um, it has allowed for us to finally understand that during the period in the 90s, right here, there was another paper called the Mariel Boat Lift that did not happen, actually happened. So this was the Mariel Boat Lift that did not not happen, okay? Um, okay, some two quick comments and thoughts. Uh, I think both of these are mentioned by George, but I'm just going to expound a little bit more. Um, the first one is on coincident treatments, and the second one is on composition. So first one, coincident treatments in the difference in different strategy, what you need to have is one, you need to have a credibly exogenous shock happen. We do have that. We have uh, Castro saying, if you want to leave, leave, and a lot of people did leave. Uh, two, you need to have a good control group. Sometimes people refer, this, refer to this as the parallel trends argument. Um, the control group should mimic what, my, what would have happened in Miami had the Mariolitos not arrived. But a third one is that there shouldn't be any other shocks happening in Miami. Okay, and uh, George did touch upon this, and it's useful thinking about what else was going on during the period uh, of the Mario Boat Lift, and I happened to find this uh, newspaper article from a local Florida newspaper, um, and it says the homicide record basically in Miami in 1980 was the highest in the entire country, okay, amongst all cities, right, and here's this really angry man here, uh, and so this also, I'm going to digress a second. This is the first movie of the two movies that I'll show you. Scarface, great film. Go see it if you haven't. I won't tell you why he's angry because that would spoil it. So you should go see for yourself, right? But why is he angry? Documentary uh, by Cocaine Cowboys. This is the first documentary of the two that I'm going to mention. Actually told me why. So I didn't really know uh, too much about what was going on in Miami at the time. Um, but it paints a really interesting picture. And to sort of give you... Uh, the setup and sort of what this documentary is about, it's about the drug trade in Miami. And here I'll show you a picture to look at instead of text while I talk. Uh, this is the murder rate in Florida. So to be clear, this is not Miami. This is the entire state of Florida because the statistics for Miami do not exist during the time of the Mario boat lift. But basically, during the early 1970s, cocaine begins to replace marijuana as the popular drug in the United States, okay? So there's increasing demand for cocaine, right? And during the mid and late 70s, the cartels in Colombia and other regions of South America actually are able to link up with uh, American pilots and American people who are willing to bring the drugs in, right? And where are they bringing all this cocaine in? They're bringing it into Miami. So there's a massive inflow of drugs into Miami in the mid and late 70s, and it sort of spreads out through the nation. The entire US is crazy about cocaine and we're spending massive amounts of money. And all that money is going back into Miami where all these drug dealers and smugglers are going through. So there's this huge local inflow of cash. Uh, whenever there is a huge local inflow of cash, there are other people who also want to get in on the action. And so a tremendous amount of violence ensues. People start shooting each other in the street. There are lots of newspaper reports of bodies piling up so high that the uh, coroner's office need to rent a refrigerated van be to handle the overflow. Um, and then slowly, the US authorities, the FBI and the Drug Enforcement Agency, uh, that is not the agency that forces you to take drugs, but actually the agency that tries to get you to not take drugs, uh, starts to figure out how they're actually importing these drugs. They figure out which American pilots are smuggling uh, drugs to their plane and sort of begin to crack down on this, this uh, drug trade. And uh, the violence slowly gets under control. I should mention that in the later years when they do have data on Miami here, uh, Miami's murder rate is more than three times the Florida level. Um, so what are the implications of this growing uh, cocaine industry during the time, specifically in Miami, um, one question is what if a sizable chunk or a portion of the Cuban immigrant refugees were absorbed by the cocaine industry? That sort of changes how we think about competition with uh, American low-skilled workers, okay? 
Also in particular, what if American pre-existing workers became cocaine cowboys themselves? What if the lowest skilled, the high skilled dropouts that we're focusing on decided to give up working as maybe a dishwasher or a janitor and move into drug trafficking, okay? Um, also the massive inflow of drugs, there is this anecdotal evidence that it was basically uh, propping up the service sector industry. People were going to clubs, they were going to bars. Um, that could have boosted low skill wages early on in the 70s. And then as the crackdowns began to ensue, as the FBI figured out what was going on, um, that could explain part of the downturn in low skill wages in the mid 1980s. The second point is about composition. George also touched on this. Um, and the question is, how much do compositional changes account for the wage decline? It's related to the earlier point. It wouldn't surprise me if amongst all this violence going on in Miami, that some native workers and possibly uh, less skilled workers decided to sort of move out of the area because there was so much uh, violence going on. And so here's just a quick table that I put together to see if people actually move around at all. This is mobility, five-year mobility rates between 1976 and 1980, just before the Mariel boat lift, of males 25 and over. The last row here is for high school dropouts. This is the group of the focus of the paper. Um, about 10% move to a different county within five years, and about 5% move to an entirely different state. So taken together, a single person who you see in 1976 is not going to be in the same place in um, 1980, that's about 15% for low skilled, right? So there is mobility. Um, and you know, this mobility may have implications for the selection of workers that we actually observe, um, leading to potentially changes in average wages. Okay, um, so some suggestions and future ideas. As George mentioned, it's very hard to get a handle on these issues because of the paucity of data. Um, there's just not a lot of good data during the time, but if it would be possible, it would be interesting to, interesting to look at migration responses. Um, also, the original card paper actually looked at employment and unemployment responses, which I think would be useful also to shed light on what was going on in the labor market there. Um, one thought is maybe there could be an extension or another separate paper uh, using the Mariel boat lift that we now know did not not happen, or the one that did happen later on um, during the 90s. That period seems maybe a little bit freer of this boom and bust in the drug trade. Um, also, to understand the distributional impacts of this inflow of refugees, I wonder what, if there are any, impacts on other workers along the skill distribution. Um, so as low-skill workers or low-skill refugees compete with low-skill workers, they may be also complementary to high-skill workers. And so is there a sense in which high-skill workers gained thereby painting a more complete picture of what happens when uh, low-skilled workers from abroad come in. Um, I think this is also policy relevant as if it's true that the less skilled lose and the high skilled gain, there are things that can be done to sort of buffer the negative impacts like redistribution. Um, and also, as George mentioned, uh, the, the finding that the wage impacts appear uh, a couple years after the boat lift is really interesting and basically uh, reminds me that we do know very little about the dynamics of immigration, and I think this is an area to be studied. So again, very interesting paper, um, and I hope everybody has a chance to read it. Okay, so on to the second paper by Doug and co-authors, Why Border Enforcement Backfired, to give you a brief recap. Basically, funding growth um, for the border, for border patrol, really grew between the 1970s and today, um, and a lot of it was predicated on the fear that people had for various different reasons, and politicians were able to successfully uh, lobby to get more money for the border um, using this rhetoric of fear, okay? And so the research question then is basically, did this large increase in funding to the border actually achieve its stated objective? Did it work? Um, and then the secondary question, uh, which the paper also goes into is how did this actually alter undocumented migration patterns, okay? So the methodology here is to assemble a, a very impressive number of data sources, and in particular, the Mexican Migration Project, which have, has a lot of information, is able to actually ask migrants about their decisions and their outcomes, and also to instrument 
for the total dollars of the border budget with the total dollars of the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency budget. Um, and the main findings here of this paper essentially are that Border Patrol seems largely unsuccessful at its stated goals. Apprehensions at the border did not change much even though there was a rapid rise in the amount of money going to the border. Okay? And some of the other interesting findings are that migrants started using less traditional crossing sites and they started having to use more dangerous crossing sites. It increased the use of a guide and increased the cost of a guide. The probability of death or dying during the journey increased and the likelihood of returning after first arriving in the United States fell. Okay? So again, I think there are a lot of great contributions to this paper. Um, it evaluates a really important and often debated policy. Uh, it is, the Mexican Migration Project data is really impressive and also the ability of this paper to draw from many data sources. Uh, it was very nice. It is also a very, very visual paper um, that can be told with a series of graphs and as Doug's presentation showed you, um, and it examines many, many outcomes to give a really great picture of what is going on with undocumented um, migrants. Um, and it has some really strong implications for U.S. border policy. So some quick thoughts and comments. Um, the first one is about the instrument, okay, the DEA budget, and the second one is about the selection and composition. Uh, so the first one, here's movie number two, Sicario, great film. Uh, this is basically a group of people affiliated with uh, the DEA and they're at a bus terminal and they're talking with, with the help of Border Patrol to some undocumented migrants to try to figure out where a drug uh, cartel leader is. The second documentary, Cartel Land, this is also, um, this person here is uh, an American vigilante who has taken it upon himself to patrol the border and here he's come across a group of uh, undocumented migrants crossing. Um, here is one of the migrants, and this, the vigilante thinks the migrant is a coyote, so he thinks that that guy is the crossing guide. Um, so what was the purpose of showing you this? Uh, the idea that um, even though the DEA and Border Patrol budgets are independent in legislation, um, what they do may impact the goals of the other, right? And so. Uh, changes in what the DEA does and changes in its resources could actually also affect the outcomes of undocumented migrants, right? So imagine the world where the Border Patrol budget doesn't change at all and we were just giving money to the DEA, we could actually still observe some of the things we see um, if the DEA is cracking down on drugs and also catching people at the border. Um, also, another, th uh, another concern for the instrument is that Changes in U.S. economic conditions or even local conditions along the border could affect both of these budgets and the outcomes of undocumented migrants. So if, you know, there are no jobs left in Arizona and California and Texas and the places where um, migrants traditionally go to, um, this could mean that <clears throat> less people try to cross over and it could mean that funding towards these areas improves as there's more uncertainty and worry about local economic conditions. Uh, the second uh, comment is about the selection composition of workers. Um, it seems that the Border Patrol did have an effect, but just not the one that it intended, uh, and it moved migration patterns to more dangerous and costly routes. Um, and so the question is, what does this imply for the type of migrant that is undertaking this journey? Uh, what does it type about, imply about the selection of people who are migrating? Um, I wonder if that could be looked at in more detail. Um, and does this selection partially account for some of the other outcomes that the paper analyzes, such as return migration, right? Is it that um, people who want to return are no longer returning because it's too dangerous, or the actual person coming in is one who is different, who has already decided I'm going to the U.S. permanently? Um, and just some quick suggestions and future ideas. Uh, final destination, that is not referring to the movie, that is referring to uh, where they actually end up settling and working in. And I'm not sure if the paper actually looked at this as an outcome, but it has all sorts of implications um, for the communities, for the cultures, for the labor markets of certain areas. So we know that it changed the crossing sites. Um, I'd be interested to know if it also changed the ultimate uh, place they ended up working and settling. Um, and then also understanding better what is the composition of the Border Patrol budget. In my very brief 
two minute foray into this last night, I downloaded the 2016 budget and I noticed that they get their own gas stations. So that's one thing that the Border Patrol budget has. Um, but the point of this is just to say, you know, different interventions may have different efficacy for border control. So I think it's useful to, to understand what it is that we actually spend our money on um, to, to try to prevent people from coming in. Okay, and finally, I'd just like to conclude very quickly that, uh, as Doug mentioned, current events are tending to reflect what we've done in the past. These two graphs show you that unauthorized or undocumented uh, migration has been falling, okay, since 2007. Um, and this paper has shown us that, you know, the Border Patrol budget and increases in Border Patrol funding haven't really done much to stem the flow or decrease the flow. Uh, but something else is at work here, right? And Doug mentioned um, changes in the demographics and changes in ages of people. I think there's a real opportunity here to study what is happening in the late period um, to potentially look for other policy tools that can uh, manage migration flows. And lastly, I lied. I wasn't just going to leave you with four choices. I'm going to leave you with a lot more choices you can look at. If I've learned anything, it's that the Hollywood has benefited enormously from all of this. Um, and here are some of the ones that, I couldn't fit all of them, but here are the, some of the ones that received pretty high ratings on Rotten Tomatoes. Thank you. Thank you.